We're back now, and we're looking at pain and sorrow of the mothers of a priest whose sons violated their vow. And in doing this, if you look at the prayer card I passed out to you, and you look there, what is written? You can see the unity and the bond between our Blessed Mother, the priest, his earthly mother, Christ, and the people. Now, I'm going to read this prayer, and you can follow along, because it describes exactly what we're talking about. Dear Savior Jesus Christ, who has entrusted the whole work of your redemption, the welfare and the salvation of the world, to priests as your representatives, I offer you through the hands of your most holy mother Mary, this present day whole and entire, with all its prayers, works, and sacrifices, its joys and sorrows for the sanctification of your priests, and for all those preparing for the priesthood. Give us true holy priests, inflamed with the fire of divine love, who seek nothing but your greater glory and the salvation of souls. And you, Mary, good mother of priests, protect all priests from dangers to their holy vocation. And with the loving hand of a mother, lead back to the good shepherd those unfortunate priests who, unfaithful to their exalted vocation, have gone astray. Amen. Now, In looking at that, to St. Margaret Mary, the Sacred Heart complained that so few priests answer his cry. I am thirsty. In St. John's Gospel, chapter 19, we read the following. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished in order that scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I thirst. Now there was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge, soaked it in wine and spring of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he hand over his spirit. Now, when he says, I thirst, he wasn't speaking about a physical thirst. He was speaking of the thirst for souls. Now, stop and think there. If you read that scripture again, and meditate upon it. What are the actions involved there? The Last Supper, the ordination of the Twelve as priests and bishops, abandonment of one, going to the Mount of Olives, the Holy Hour, 
He takes Peter, James, and John. In that prayer, his priestly prayer, he's praying not only that the cup may pass, but the Father's will be done for souls. Then, the scourging, the crowning, the carrying of the cross, the crucifixion itself, the people that had followed him and lined the streets, the ones that stood in Pilate's courtyard and said, give us Jesus, while the others said, give us Barabbas. He was thirsting for their souls. And he knew he had entrusted that care to his apostles. And so that unity and bond on Calvary has to be, as he says here, to St. Margaret Mary, I have a burning thirst to be honored in the Blessed Sacrament. And I find hardly anyone who endeavors according to my desires to quench that thirst by making some returns to me. It grieves my sacred heart to see the scandalous disparity between the high ideal of the priesthood and its poor realization. For a priest who turns away from the Lord loses his heart and soul that are to be united with the eternal high priest. He becomes lost in worldly desires that break the bonds of unity with Christ and the vows by which a priest has committed himself to live. So if that bond is broken and that trust is gone, he abandoned souls trusted to his care. Someone else has got to feed and quench their thirst. And today that's few, far, and in between. Because parishes don't have a priest full time. So the laity are called to evangelize, to care for the souls of their brothers and sisters, or permanent deacons that are assigned to a parish. They cannot hear confession, but they could sit and listen to the cries of the poor, as it were, to the children who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and like St. Stephen, those deacons embrace the children of God. Just like in the early scripture, when the presbyter does come, the priest, then the deacon can lay before him the cup. The cup which thirsts. That is why the deacon is always the minister of the blood of Christ <coughs> at Mass. In the rubrics and in the general instruction for the Roman Missal, it says that the deacon is the minister of the cup. He is offering, when the presbyter or priest comes, he is offering the care of those souls of that community to that priest by saying, Father, these people need and want to go to confession. Father, these people need to speak to you. Father, these people need now the Eucharist and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
And so the deacon stands with the priest and offers the love of that faithful community to the priest as the priest offers the sacrifice of the Mass. The deacon proclaims the word. The deacon prepares the altar of sacrifice. And then at communion, the deacon takes the precious blood and offers it to the faithful. So that that unity of heart, that bond, is never broken. And if it is broken, then it is done by one who is not faithful, who has abandoned and has hurt the flock. How can one who hurts someone of his flock then stand at the altar of God? One may say, okay, he is altar of Christus. Yes. But Jesus never hurt anyone. He embraced and loved everyone. And especially the sinners. He said, let the sinners come to me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes he scolded his apostles who were trying to keep people away. Jesus would say, let them come. Let them come to me. Mercy is mine to give them in fulfillment of the love of my heart. Thus, this experience of grace of the Lord's friendship, we are seeking for the glory of God. On page 21, January 2008. I long for the company of every one of my priests. I wait for you in the sacrament of my love. So if you priests respond to my desire, when I choose a man to be my priest, I choose him at the same time to be a privileged friend of my sacred heart. Our desire, the friendship of my priests, and I offer them mine. I have called you to experience the grace of my friendship. I want you to be for my heart another John. Loving me, seeking me, listening to me, abiding in my presence. Thus the Eucharist is not only an incorporation of the life of Christ, it is also an incorporation of his death. Our Mass not only looks back to the first coming of Christ, but forward to the second coming. The Mass is also a mystical representation of the death of Christ. Through the separate consecration of bread and wine, typifying the separation of the blood from the body of Christ. This mystical and unbloody representation of the death of Christ commits us to the discipline and mortification of the body when we leave the altar. 
Thus, we are united in every Mass to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Thus, we are called to experience the grace of the Lord's friendship. We are to be, for the heart of Jesus, another St. John, loving the Lord, seeking the Lord, listening to the Lord, and living in his presence. That's the essence of the priesthood. And that's what the laity want from their priests. They want that understanding, that radiance, that giving. I want you, my priest, to radiate this love of my heart to all my people. Jesus says you must embrace them as little children. Care for them. Strengthen them. Forgive them. Feed them. For your heart must speak to their heart. Your heart must speak to their heart. That is the bond of unity that the priest must have for his flock. If that heart is not united to the heart of the flock within that parish community, and a priest breaks that bond of trust, then the trust of the faithful and the priest are far apart. Then there is no bond to unite. If a priest is not living true to his vows and he has broken those vows and he has given his love not faithfully to his parish community but to someone else in either lust or ab abusing someone then that trust is gone. There cannot be that unity of heart if the love isn't sincere and isn't there. How can one be a true lover of one who does not love? That's what the priesthood is about. It is loving and being loved, giving and sharing to the body of Christ, to the body of Christ. Scripture relates this in the focus of Christ himself. Jesus wants to be near us. We don't know for sure when Jesus will return in glory. But until that day, he promised to be with us. The Old Testament book called Proverbs says, My delights were to be with the children of men. These words express a beautiful and a great love for the Son of God and the human race. We want to be near to those we love. So when the second person of the Blessed Trinity became man, his intention was to remain on earth until the end of the world, but showing us how to be good. He could make us happy by keeping us close to God. He could give us a foretaste of the joys of heaven. That's what the priesthood has to do for the people he loves. To the servants he serves. It's like a husband and wife. When one gets married, one chooses the person he or she loves. There is that dating process. And through that period, 
If that love isn't compatible, they part ways. It's like that with the priest. That's why there's seminaries. If one says, I want to be a priest, and he enters the seminary, and as he goes along, he finds that his heart isn't fully in this, this isn't for me, then it's the time to say, I leave. Before I make that final commitment and become ordained. So that he can go out again and try to find that love which the Lord is calling him to. Just like in marriage. If that love is sincere and that bond of love is united. And the couple are truly in love with one another. Without any flaw. Then that is true sincere love. They are married. And that joy is complete. The same with the priest. As he goes through the years of the seminary, if that love is fulfilled and it is true, he becomes ordained. Now, not saying that after ordination or in marriage, there are temptations along the way that can either destroy or hurt a relationship. In the case of the priests who have abused, this is hurt. A deep hurt. It's like a man who abuses his wife. and leaves her goes out and gets drunk comes back beats her again or violates her as a woman in ways unbefitting marriage forces himself upon her commits actual rape of his own wife that is why some of them are afraid to come back. It would be like a woman that leaves and a husband calls her up and says, Honey, you know, I'm sorry for what I've done. Come on home. I won't hurt you. Can she trust him? That trust is gone. That love relationship is gone. And so too with these poor people that have been violated. Can they say, well, can I trust this priest? They don't know. Because they have been hurt by one who says, I care. By one who stood at the altar by one who in the confessional forgave their sins, by one who walked with them, now has violated them in a way beyond, in a way beyond that has truly robbed us in faith. This now, this unity and bond of being kept close to God must now come back. And people must see that, yes, in the true priests that are faithful and have given themselves totally to Christ, they are the ones who will embrace and truly love them in the forgiveness and the mercy of the divine Savior. After our Lord's ascension into heaven, his followers would no longer be able to see him face to face, but they could see him in a different way in his church. 
as members of the church, they would be united with him most closely as the branches are united with the vine, or as the different parts of the body are joined to the head. But it wasn't enough for the heart of Jesus to be united with us in a general way. He wanted to unite himself with each individual soul. That's the key. Each individual soul. To accomplish this, he worked the greatest of all miracles. He instituted the Blessed Sacrament. And this, too, one must understand. When one comes for communion, he is approaching the divine lover. So that those words, the body of Christ, to you, that individual, that soul that answers Christ <clears throat> with all men is like those in the upper room when they were praying said all men which means so be it Lord and we pointed this out before it is important that when I come for communion to unite my heart and soul with the heart of Christ, that I say amen. Some people don't say anything. Some say thank you. You're not going to a fast food restaurant and saying thank you to the clerk that's giving you your hamburger. It doesn't work that way. Yes. What about those that say I believe? The, the church says amen. That's the only response to be given. Amen. Because it's the acknowledgement of why I am standing here before you, Lord. It's the acknowledgement of my heart and soul uniting you with the heart of the priest who has offered this sacrifice and has made Christ present for you out of love and mercy that that amen is the complete action of my giving of self and of Christ through his priest giving Jesus to you. And if that amen is not complete, then I am not united with the love by which Jesus wants us to be united. In the Latin liturgy, <coughs> the priest would say, Corpus Dominum Nostrum Jesum Christi, Custodiat Adam Tum and Vitam Eternum, and he would answer for you, Amen. <coughs> now, you have to answer the Amen. It's the same words, only in English. When did it come in? Was it the ecumenical council when we started receiving it in our hand instead of just on our tongue? I can't remember. It was after Vatican II. Okay. Yes. Yes. But that unity and bond for the love of the Eucharist must be related and radiated to you the faithful, so that you may come to know, love, and serve the Lord through Eucharistic faithfulness in Mass. 
See, that's what page 21 is bringing out. The duty of the priest to his people. And what he must do to make them come in close to the heart of Christ at every Mass by being faithful and loyal unto himself. Because if that is not there, that unity is broken. That bond of love with the priest, the people, and the Eucharist. If that is broken, then it is gone. Page 21 is showing us that our love for the priesthood and the priest's love for his people must always be a sincere unity like that of John opening our heart that the priest must open his heart to the faithful so that the faithful may see their priests and the grace and the mercy and the love that Christ gives. Okay, now it is time for our Holy Mass, and we will now end with the prayer of St. Benedict. <clears throat> Dear St. Benedict, you are a blessing indeed as your name indicates. Practicing what you preach, you founded the monastic tradition of the West, by joining prayer to labor for God, both liturgical and private prayer. Help all religious to follow their rule and to be true to their vocation.